Ad visum Christ, Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus Tecum. Benedicta tuum di arbus, benedictus fructus ventris tu, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre, Amen. In nomine Patris, et Filii, Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Brother in Christ, Laudate to Jesus Christus in secula. This is Timothy Flanders at the Meaning of the Catholic. Jesus is King. We enter into the final book of the Holy Scriptures, the book of Revelation, the book of the Apocalypse. The full name of this book is The Revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the book that has the title the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it's 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 crazy that this book, not only is the whole Bible neglected by Catholics, but this book in particular is neglected. And it's the climax of the entire Bible. The climax of the entire Bible. It, it might have more Old Testament references than any other book of the New Testament. It brings together so many different books and so many different typologies and so many different images and symbols and things that it is It is this glorious book of prophecy that is truly marvelous and wonderful. It might be my favorite book of the Bible. I don't know. It's a hard, It's a big toss up between Genesis and Revelation, the, the two two books I love studying and reading so much. So today we're going to talk about this book of Revelation and why it's so important for you in our time to read this book, because it is a book for the church. It's a book of prophecy for the church in our time, in our time of exile. And we're going to talk all about that. How can a Catholic understand and appreciate this important book and this is the end of our biblical series, at least the ending of this, this year. In November, we're ending the liturgical year, and so we're completing the liturgical Bible reader. This is the Bible reader where we read the entire Bible every year. And this is a part of our Fellowship of St. Anthony. So if you want to join us to read the entire Bible every year, according to the liturgical plan, the traditional office of Matins, so this is the Catholic Bible in a Year program, traditionally speaking. If you want to join us, you need to go to munitifcatholic.com slash register to join the Guild community. You can donate anything you can per month. And if you can't afford it, you can always join for free. Just contact us, munitifcatholic.com slash contact. And then you have to be a part of the Guild, but then you also have a penance requirement. If you want to read the Holy Scriptures every year, all throughout the whole the whole scriptures every year you want to really enter into the holy scriptures for gaining wisdom and advancing in the spiritual life you have to do penance that's a requirement so you have to join the fellowship of saint anthony and if you want to do all those things and you can do all those things then you can join our bible reading group and read the entire bible every year and so we're going to continue to do these 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 videos as, throughout the year, we haven't completed, we haven't done a video for every single book of the Bible yet, but we're going to continue to do all these different videos of individual books of the Bible to provide a Catholic approach to the Holy Scriptures. This is all based on my book, Introduction of the Holy Bible for Traditional Catholics, A Beginner's Guide to Reading the Scriptures for Spiritual Profit. This book is very much a a, a, uh, a mea culpa for my many, many my many years as a Protestant, and how the Holy Scriptures, reading the Holy Scriptures, actually made me Catholic. But e even though I was uh, unfortunate to be born and grow in in heretical depravity, the Protestants did teach me to love and study the Holy Scriptures, which is really a Catholic thing. It is a Catholic thing to love and study the Holy Scriptures. It's simply not, it's never been popular among the laity as it was and became popular among the Protestant laity. Because the church has never, has always recommended reading the Holy Scriptures and always led, led that. But it is not recommended to read the Holy Scriptures without proper commentary. So the, the reason for this show is to provide that Catholic commentary so that you can enter into the Holy Scriptures properly and not fall into heresy. And the book of Revelation is 
perhaps one reason why it is neglected is that but it it has been misused especially in modern times by protestants in such a crazy way to try to comment on on politics and whatnot and and this is unfortunate because as i will attempt to show this book is so remarkable and so important and so powerful and and comforting and consoling and strengthening for our time that we need to read it and understand it as catholics so let's talk about the book um what we'll do here is we'll provide a preview in in the first portion we're going to provide uh, just a real basic introduction and then in the guild portion we will talk about all these different controversial topics that are uh, actually illuminate i think modern some modern questions as well um so we're going to talk about that in the guild portion so you want if you want the whole treatment you have to go to meaningofcatholic.com slash register for the whole treatment so um first of all i want to mention a few resources that you can get get right now the ignatius study bible has the the latest commentary by scott Hahn and curtis mitch in so the only one that's out right now is the new testament god willing i i hope that the full bible will be released this year even god willing who knows but the new testament is out so you can buy the new testament you can read the revelation commentary it's absolutely fantastic also taylor marshall's uh book the eternal city uh rome and the origins of catholic christianity this is a fantastic text uh part of his um origins of catholicism volume three his, his original trilogy i think these were maybe his first books actually when he was catholic but very very t wonderful um commentary historical commentary and revelation in there he also has a podcast that he has on his, on his youtube channel that goes into this now i want to recommend what if you if you've really assimilated the catholic resources that's when you can avail yourself to some of the protestant resources and in what you need to do, what Catholics need to know about Protestant resources is that you need to be fully on, fully ca self catechized if necessary in your own Catholic faith to be able to detect the Protestant heresies out there. So the thing that is that there's a lot of Protestant resources where they're just talking about the Bible qua Bible. What I mean by that is they're just taking the Holy Scripture and using it to understand other aspects of the Holy Scripture. And they're not doing theology. So they're not trying to draw out their theological conclusions and their heretical ideas out of the Bible. They're simply showing the various aspects of the Bible itself. So they're basically reporting on the Bible. The Bible, here's the Bible, is what it says. So uh, uh, I've recently been introduced to a uh, Protestant commentary. His name's James Jordan. And he is a man who has pretty much memorize the entire Bible. And this is how he's able to understand the book of the apocalypse. Because if you understand the entire, you, you've memorized the entire Old Testament, you're able to see all these things come to life in the in the book of Revelation. And so what he's doing, what he does is he's just showing all of the typology. It, essentially, he, he really reads the scripture like a Catholic. He has a Catholic methodology for seeing the the typology of the Old Testament and looking at all these things in the book of Revelation. So this is this is recommended to me by my uh, friend and colleague Gideon Lazar, uh, also Seraphim Hamilton, uh, Eastern Orthodox guy who, whom I respect, recommended James Jordan to me. And I've just been getting into his commentary on the apocalypse and it's it's absolutely wonderful. It's a, it's a fantastic um, text or, or, or commentary. But the thing that you need to have is that once in a while, these Protestants will, they'll make a passing remark about theology. And that's when Catholics need to understand some of these Protestants, they know the Bible very well. They're able to bring out these riches of the text, but then as soon as they start to do theology, that's when they go astray. So it's kind of like Eastern Orthodox, like Catholic Catholics can read Eastern Orthodox books as long as they're talking about, the Greek tradition qua Greek tradition, because in that they're fully Catholic. And in the same way that when the Protestants are just talking about the Bible as the Bible, they're just talking about what the Bible says and how it parallels itself and has the typology within itself. They're not doing any sort of theology that's not Catholic. They're basically, they are doing Catholic theology. 
but they're Protestants. So as soon as they start talking about theology and drawing these conclusions, that's when they go astray. Now we're going to talk about the the most powerful, one of the most powerful Marian passages, which takes place in Revelation 12. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. And this is also an apologetic that you as Catholics can use for your Protestant separated brethren to win them over to the faith. Um, but I just want to provide some real basic context. So we need to remember that the first century Jewish education that was going on at this time, it was quite common to educate ordinary people to memorize the Torah and the in the entire Old Testament. This was not uncommon. You need to understand when you read my book, Introduction to the Holy Bible, this was an oral culture where people could memorize things very easily in a way that we can't do today. People were able to memorize these things. So if you have an audience who has memorized the entire Old Testament, and then what they would do is that they would receive a letter like this, like this is a, the apocalypse is a letter to the seven churches of Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. They would receive the letter and then they would read the entire thing in one sitting. So they would get all, everybody together and then someone would read it out to everybody and everyone would listen to it. So they'd spend a few hours reading it, reading it all the way through. And it, in an oral culture, people can, in an oral culture where people don't read, they can listen, they can hear something once and then be able to repeat it verbatim again. And th this is, seems incredible to us, but that's, that's exactly what oral cultures are. And that's the context of the Holy scripture. So this is the, this is the type of study that is necessary to start to enter into this world of the, the apocalypse. But thankfully our, the, the church, our Holy fathers have been, uh, our, our forefathers have been reading and commenting on this for centuries. So we don't need to, uh, be able to memorize everything and remember everything just like that. But this is the, this is the aspect of the apocalypse that we need to understand and why why we can safely assume that the early church would understand this text much more readily than we can because they would have the old testament memorized and they would also be knowing the events that were going on which we'll discuss the reign of nero the uh threatening of the destruction of jerusalem and they would see all these things and they would see them much more clearly which we're going to do in just a minute so the exegetical tradition of the Catholic Church understands Revelation under three aspects. This is an important aspect of Catholic exegetical tradition, that there are various senses of the Holy Scripture. We talk about this in the book. There's the literal sense, which forms, the literal sense forms the basis of everything else. But when you're dealing with prophecy, prophecy uses sim symbolism to illustrate spiritual truths. And so St. John is seeing the revelation of Jesus Christ, where our Lord Jesus Christ is manifest. First of all, he's manifesting himself as the King of Kings, which as in my book, I, I, I mentioned how the term King of Kings comes from the Persian Empire propaganda. So he's claiming for himself the title of the Persian Emperor, and he's also claiming for himself the title of the Son of God, which is coming from the prophecy to Solomon, but it, it was also taken on by the Caesar, Julius Caesar dynasty under Augustus. So he's the son of God. So Jesus is the son of God. He's the king of kings, Lord of Lord. He is taking on himself the political identity of all these current empires at this time. And he's manifesting himself in the revelation of Jesus Christ as the king of kings and lords of lords. So this is the manifestation, just like the transfiguration was manifesting his glory before his passion. The revelation of Jesus Christ is manifesting his glorious uh, kingship over the, over the worlds, over the over Christ as king, over the universe. The, here's the three aspects of the revelation we need to understand. One is the literal historical sense. In that this book is written to seven churches of, of Asia Minor as a warning that Jesus is about to destroy Jerusalem. And indeed, he does destroy Jerusalem in the apocalypse. And that's exactly what happened. And we'll talk about why it's important that we understand that aspect of it, because the final, the finality is the, is the 
building of the third temple, i.e. the new Jerusalem. So the we're going to talk about the, all this in the in the guild portion, which is more controversial. We talk about the mark of the beast, the dragon, the synagogue of Satan. We'll talk about all those things in the guild portion. But what we have is we have a real spiritual union of Jerusalem and Rome that was prophesied in Daniel and prophesied in the book of Maccabees against the conspiracy of Satan, which is also a conspiracy of Jerusalem and Rome, but it's the false Jerusalem and the false Rome. And these are the beasts that come out of the water and on the land of the dragon and the synagogue of Satan. We'll talk about all that and what the mark of the beast is, which, which is a reference to Ezekiel. So that's the historical aspect is this warning to the seven churches that Christ is about to destroy Jerusalem. And in, in the same way that he destroyed Jerusalem, he's about to destroy you, O Ephesus, you, O Philadelphia, you, O Sardis. And he talks to each of these seven churches, these seven cities in these, or these seven churches in these seven cities. So that's the whole context of the book of Revelation is this warning. That's the historical kind of, that's the first aspect. Okay. The second aspect is the fact that this is not only a prophecy to the current day early church of the time, it's also a prophecy of the entire history of the church from the crucifixion to the second coming. So all throughout history, the story of the apocalypse repeats itself. And we can, we can go through history. We don't have time to do this, but we can go through history. We can actually look at all these things. We can think about, for example, the sack of Rome under Pope Clement VII in the 1500s and how the sack of Rome was the catalyst which brought about the Council of Trent. Before that, the Protestant revolt was happening. There was the Christ was opening the chalice, the new chalices of that day, the chalices of wrath, as he does in the apocalypse. He was opening the chalices of wrath and he was opening the chalice of wrath on the city of Rome. And the sack of Rome was the key that caused the repentance that is prophesied in the apocalypse. So the apocalypse provides the meaning of church history. It's that is what's so remarkable about it. It provides this, this liturgical, liturgical and typological key to church history. And all of this is just the eschatological discourse of Jesus Christ, because there's an eschatological discourse in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which prophesies both the destruction of Jerusalem and the second coming, which is the third aspect that I'll get to get into. Um, but in St. John's gospel, there is no eschatological discourse. So the book of Revelation becomes that eschatological discourse. So, so there's those three aspects. So there's the historical aspect of apocalypse. There's the church history aspect of the apocalypse. And then finally, as I said, the, third aspect of the apocalypse is is indeed prophesying that second coming and so there is this threefold sense of the apocalypse and that's what's so glorious about the book is that it provides us with this key in this meaning of history this prophecy to the early church and to all of the church throughout time so lastly before we cut to the guild portion and we talk more about the controversial aspects i want to provide all of y'all with the apologetical tool here to uh, give to protestants your protestant friends and family is to turn to revelation chapter eleven nineteen, which says this and the temple of god was opened in heaven and the ark of his testament was seen in his temple and there were lightnings and voices and an earthquake and great hail and a great sign appeared in heaven a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 store stars and being with child she cried travailing in birth and was in pain to be delivered and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with an iron rod and her son was taken up to god and to his throne and then there's it tells about the struggle between the dragon and the woman. And then at the end of chapter 12, it says, chapter verse 17, and the dragon was angry with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And this provides the, exeg the ecclesiolo ecclesiological key 
to the Marian passage in which our Lord says, behold thy mother. He speaks to St. John, behold thy mother, behold thy son, behold thy mother. And he, and he links Mary to St. John. And St. John brings Mary to Artemis Ephesia in Ephesus. And that's, but that's another story. Read my book, City of God, for that, that drama. But Catholics can look at this verse. First of all, you have to start with chapter 11, verse 19. Remember, the original text of the Holy Scripture did not include chapters and verses. So you have to start with verse 19 of 11, and that's where you get the Ark of His Testament was seen His temple. Because the Ark of the Covenant is Mary. That is the typology of the Old Testament, is the Ark of the Covenant, which holds the bread, the manna. Mary, as just as Mary holds the bread of life, Jesus. And then we see that this, this Ark of the Testament is, he sees the Ark of the Testament and the Ark of the Testament, then he sees the woman. The woman becomes this typological key going back into the Old Testament. So seeing all the references to the Ark of the Testament. So there's the, the temple is the church. That's what St. Saint, Saint Peter says in his epistle. You are the temple of God built with living stones. So this is the third temple. This is that third temple. Uh, the prophet Haggai says the glory of this second temple will exceed that of the first. And that's because Mary brought Jesus, who is the glory. He's the Shekinah glory. He, she brought Jesus to that second temple, which was to become his throne. But as he says, and which we'll, we'll, we'll get, well, actually we'll, we'll get into the destruction of Jerusalem in a minute, but in terms of the apologetic tool, we can note that what chapter 12 does is it identifies Mary as an icon of the church. Mary becomes an icon of the church because all Christians are identified as her seed, which goes right back to woman, behold thy son, behold thy mother. St. Paul says that we put on Christ. We put on Christ like a piece of clothing. We are baptized into Christ. We become truly one with Christ. And if that's the case, then Mary becomes our mother. So we can we can tell Protestants, Protestants, you know, my Protestant brother, do you desire to truly be one with Christ? Do you truly de desire to be one with Christ? And if you do, then Mary becomes your mother. So says Revelation 12, 17. Mary becomes your mother. Now, what they'll try to do is they'll say, no, no, this passage is all about the church. But that's a false dichotomy. It's the passage about the church and Mary as the icon thereof. The church does not give birth to Christ. Christ's body is the church. So how can, how can you say that a woman, behold a woman, and there's a, a woman is a sign, and she brought forth a man child who was the rule of the nations with an iron rod? Clearly, that's Mary and the Christ child. But at the same time, Mary becomes the icon of Christ. It is a dogma of the faith that Mary had no pains in childbirth. So how can she be travailing in pain? But this is the passion of Our Lady as the co-redemptrix, as Our Lady of Sorrow. And when she entered into her passion in union with the passion of Christ, that that is her birth pains because it's the birth of the church. Then she's giving birth to the church who become her seed because every Christian is baptized into Christ. So in this great mystery of the church and Mary and Christ, she is the fulfillment of the type of the Ark of the Testament. So I think that chapter 12 is a great exegetical tool because it really shows this glory of Mary that we have in the Catholic church that the Protestants do not have. The Protestants do not follow revelation 12. They ignore it or they try to explain it away, but we need to use this in order to glorify Mary who glorifies Christ. So more on this. We'll talk about in the guild portion. Once again, we'll talk about the mark of the beast, the synagogue of Satan, and the conspiracy of Antichrist. So if you want the full portion, 
meaningofcatholic.com/slash register. Be right back. Oh. 